You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got some special guests in the building. Yes, sir. Charles, Keith, and Lori Rothschild. Good, Good morning, morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for They're having us. They're here to us. talk to us about the, the case of uh, Kevin Keith versus Kevin Keith. the state of Ohio. Yes. Now, Go tell ahead, us start. what's going on with this case and, and what happened. Well, there was a murder that took place in a small rural, basically white town called Bucyrus, Ohio. My brother was convicted uh, in their judicial system. Uh, all white jury, uh, everybody that was involved in it was white. We went to the court. You know, he had his, uh, his trial. Uh, I assumed that the trial was going to be fair because in our system you're supposed to have due judicial process, due mm -hmm. process of law. We paid attention to this case. We didn't know whether uh, how the outcome was going to be. Mm -hmm. They found him guilty. We were we lost it as a family. How did you guys find this man guilty? Again, we had no money. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but we had no intelligence. We mm -hmm. were an ignorant family. We had no inside track to the law, so to speak. And your inside track is usually your attorney. Right. So they left us. They played us as who we were, a poor black family with no money, no intellect, no father, no nothing. So we were an easy mark. So Kevin Keith is convicted. He's on his way to death row. Horrible. What Happened fast, too. Yes. Within, what? A hundred days. hundred days. Mm. So, so y'all thought he was innocent, so y'all really wouldn't well, have much to worry about. Because exactly. Because he didn't do it. You know, they said that uh, it was Kevin's fault because he decided to take the case uh, within the 90-day speedy trial rule. Kevin told him, what's the difference? I didn't do it. Right. So he's in here in prison on death row for all their mistakes. Now, so, let me ask you this. You did some digging yourself. Yes. And what did you find out? Because I'm sure when you found when you found out he was being charged with this, you're like, there's no way. There were alibis. There were people who were with him at the time that the murder was committed. So you thought, obviously, there's no way he could be convicted. But then you decided, well, let me get some more research well, done. I didn't decide to investigate the case. I just wanted to see what they had. I wanted to find something. Show me something that my brother's guilty. I'll let it go. I mean, I'm not an attorney. All, all I could do was basically read and write. Mm -hmm. So as I continued to read these documents, it wasn't matching up with what they said in court. And these were police documents. These right. were actually official police documents. And what they were saying on these documents did not mesh with what they were saying in court and in the transcripts. So at that point, I knew something was wrong. Now, what did they say happened? Yeah, I was going to say, who got murdered, and, and why was your brother even connected to it? There was a black family. Uh, there was a black family that was murdered. Uh, they were set up through a, an informant. Well, the police officers, the two white police officers, n were trying to get the informant killed. But what happened, the guy couldn't find the informant, so he went in and shot up the family. Now, the police had set up this thing for the informant to get killed because they were involved and this big pharmacy thing. So everything got out of hand once the guy didn't kill the informant. Just say allegedly, just in case. Allegedly. There you go. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. But again, I have their documents, and right, that's so why we're in Supreme Court. these are all in the paperwork, and this is... Yes, these are all legal documents. Mm -hmm. so and it's, impor I, it's also important to know that, you know, th we have the opportunity sitting here in 2018 to have the entire story in front of us. Mm -hmm. When Charles, when, when Kevin got convicted and sentenced to death within 100 days... days yeah. mm -hmm. Charles started with nothing. Mm -hmm. He started with how the heck did that happen? Mm -hmm. And now we know, based on their own documentation, by records, by police reports, by transcripts, newspaper articles, and a pharmacy burglary report that was done by the state of Ohio, we now know that two white police officers mm -hmm. were involved in a pharmacy burglary ring in Ohio. They were probably getting either a kickback, drugs, or money. Mm -hmm. And they had a confidential informant working for them to keep them safe. And when the state started to investigate these big burglaries going on, they said, holy cow, this guy knows too much of what's going on. We need him out. They knew a hit was going to go down on the guy. The guy just happened to not be home that night. Mm. So two women and three children, all black, shot mm. in a house, right? But still, when they walk out of that house that night, right, even though the wrong guy is dead, they still have to protect their relationship with that pharmacy burglary ring. Why? Because they also know too much. It's about saving face for these police officers, so they frame 
Kevin Keith. What did they find Kevin Keith? Like, why was he even, like, why him well, of all people? Someone you know? had mentioned that there was a large black man on the premises. Well, this is an all-white community, sort of like the projects. There was a large black man out there, but it proved not to be my brother. Police didn't care. They kept going. Once, If they'd have brought him in and questioned him with that 72 hours, we have 72 hours to question you and so on and so forth, had they done that, it would have gave them some time. But that's not what they did. They brought him in and cuffed him and stuffed him right there. Now, once they started finding out additional information, they could have fixed it, mm -hmm. but they didn't. That's where the corruption and conspiracy came in at. Didn't it also turn out that one of the police officers married a confidential informant? That's true. This was the person that was involved in the pharmacy ring. Again, wife can't testify against the husband. There was a lot of things that CI did. There was a lot of things that the police officer did. It's not going to come to the surface. I've been to every black person out there, every church, everybody I can think of. I received no help. I have To this day, I have received no help from anybody black, the black community whatsoever. And it's not their fault. Because when I looked in their eyes, I saw some historic fear. Yeah. I saw it, mm. you know? And they're like, Charles, good luck, man. You know what's going on? And they backed off. I mean, if you're living in a, a, a town that would do something as corrupt as they did to your brother, imagine how everybody else feels. They feel like that. the same thing could happen to me. How does, how does pinning the mur I understand how pinning that on your brother keeps them from being uh, complicit with the murders, but how did that keep them from being complicit with the pharmaceutical company? They were two separate things. Okay. There, this police officer down there, he had like maybe six or seven cases going. He got caught up. So what he did, he pushed all the cases together to make it look like he was doing this great big huge work. He was really busy. And what it did, it caused confusion. Mm. And to me, another word of confusion is doubt. So when somebody doubts something, they're more or less going to walk away from it. You know, it's just not adding up. So the pharmacy burglary um, investigation. So basically these burglaries are going on all over the state of Ohio. Right. And these cops were getting kickbacks. We now know this in 2018 that this is this is all fact. Right. Mm -hmm. um, when the state realizes that these the police are actually looking into these burglaries, but no arrests were ever made. They send in a state detective to look into it. And when that state detective comes on, those two cops go, "Uh oh, we have to cover our ass because they are going to find out that we're getting kickbacks. Mm. So what do they do? They get rid of their confidential informant, the target of the of the murders that night, and they insert a new confidential informant, someone else to work with, right? Who is that? It's a woman by the name. Well, we won't use her name. Right. But there's a woman who he's now married to. That's mm -hmm. the confidential, confidential informant that he's married to. But when the state comes in, that investigation actually happens at the exact same time as, as the murder trial is happening for Kevin. Two separate cases, both are linked. The state knew about it. The defense didn't know about it. The Keith family had no idea about this huge investigation going on. Why didn't the cops put those two cases together? It clearly showed in their report, listed in their report, that another man was paid to commit the crime. Why didn't they go after that man? Mm. Well, Lori, tell the people who you are and how you got Sorry. connected to this case, because they might not know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, my name is Lori Rothschild. I, um, I'm i a documentary film producer. Mm. I, uh, I do true crime TV. Um, and everyone asks me, you know, how did I get associated with the Kevin Keith story? Mm -hmm. And I always say very clearly, it chose me. Mm -hmm. it, was on, it was in my inbox four or five times before I actually opened it and paid attention to it. And one of the things that changed me, and now I'm an advocate, and I hope that other people will join us because this is this is a problem that's not going away, especially in 2018 where we see this every single day. Charles had said to me very clearly when we received the information that the United States Supreme Court was actually considering giving Kevin a new trial, mm -hmm. um, we were on the phone, and he teared up, and he very rarely tears up, and he said to me, he said, Lori, it's not their fault. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, Lori, you know, look around you. It's white people helping me. He said, the black community can't help me because, and it's not their fault because they're afraid what's going to happen on the streets. Mm -hmm. They're afraid what's going to happen. They're, they're, they don't trust the police. He said, but you do. That's and why it's goes, always important for white people to use their privilege to combat prejudice. That is right. And, I, yeah. and he said to me, which I had, it's extreme wake up call for me and for my family and for the people that, you know, listen, it's, he said to me, Lori, that's the black experience in the United States of America. I, is, is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I literally, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't stupid. I could read and write. Right. So everybody bases, you know, you're gonna, that's your base education. 
when they handed me this stuff, I didn't have a clue. I mean, they, I mean, they always give you your paperwork. Here's, I mean, I, there's so much paper in my house. I just, my carpet was actually all legal documents. Mm-hmm. I had made charts so I could continue to list things, and that's where I lived for so many years until this stuff just absorbed in my mind. I finished, I graduated almost last in my graduation class. I clowned, I cracked jokes. It wasn't important to me because mm-hmm. where I was going to live my life, I didn't need a college education or an education. And then I found out here we are, and the criminal justice system played us for just who we are, poor blacks, ignorant, no money, no anything. So here I am, the oldest in our family, the father figure. I mean, I'm obligated. I have no choice. Mm. And when they asked me during the clemency how many of our family members were going to attend the execution and if we were going to buy back his body, I couldn't believe this. Mm. I mean, it was so cold. Wow. And as I was telling Lori, how did you get this done? Well, everything about me and, and, my, and, and the people that were around us was negativity. You know, we, that's what we swirl around. I literally had to de-black myself. I changed, I changed the way I dressed. I changed the way I talk. I stopped wearing the hat gear. I had to stop everything because everybody I was talking to was white. Suit and tie, the lingo, the language, the tone, the everything. I had no money. I don't like the term deep black. Yeah, I don't myself. like deep well, black. I don't like that. And I understand but that. I, I understand but you have to understand, saying. I had to create, become a new person. Because mm-hmm. uh, there's no such thing. You can't deep black. Yourself. Exactly. Well, again, you got to realize who I am. I was, I'm not a college graduate. You know, I was educated, wasn't educated at Ohio State. I was educated by the state of Ohio. Mm. So wherever I could get help, this is where I had to go. So, Do you feel like people wouldn't have supported you, the, the white people that were working with you, if you would have went in there as who you were before all that? I couldn't take that chance. Mm. We're talking the death penalty. And I already had seen what had happened and some of the people I had to talk to. So I had to prepare myself for this. I literally took a job as a volunteer at a halfway house. They eventually hired me so I could understand what these legal documents were. I've got piles of paper. I don't know what that stuff is. Mm-hmm. So I worked there for almost 14 years. I moved up almost to being their director. So now I understand the law. Now I'm a generic attorney. Now I'm ready to make my moves. And then I started making my moves, and it got him off death row. Well, yeah, well, so that's what it was? So it- what we did, there was two attorneys on this in the beginning, and Kevin says, Chuck, we're in this thing 13 years, man, and it's getting tough. Well, these were st- were, well, who were these attorneys? Were they appointed by? Yes, they were appointed by the, the sentencing judge. Mm-hmm. So we got rid of them. Now here we are with no lawyers, no attorneys, nothing. I represented my brother for about six months. And then we finally went to the Ohio Public Defender's Office. We found a rookie attorney. We went in there. I thought she was a young girl. And we talked and we talked. And she says, well, Kevin has no more appeals left. I said, are you telling me those past attorneys burnt all his appeals? See, they know what's going on. Right. It's their system. I'm trying to learn it. I'm trying to save my brother. Right. No compassion, no nothing caring. And she says, well, Kevin has no appeals left. And I says, are you kidding me? She says, no, the only thing that's left is execution. Unless we can go in and discuss actual innocence. I said, so there's a difference in law of innocence and actual innocence. Yes. So we had to go in on the premise that this is actual innocence. So that's where we went. So- is it possible? Oh, no, so the information that was found. So Charles pulls up to Col- Columbus is three hours away from Charles's home, and he's got this big accordion style, you know, docket of paperwork that he's collected throughout these thirteen years. Mm-hmm. And she, he goes into this rookie public defender's office and asks for help. And she said, "Well, what do you have?" And and he goes, "Here, take all of this stuff. Take all of it. Look at all of it." And in that she was able to clearly see that a name kept popping up, the same name of this police officer who was investigating. So she took it upon herself to start looking into what was going on with those police. Mm -hmm. And what she uncovered was the pharmacy burglary ring and the report. Once they got their hands on the report, now remember this is 13 years Mm -hmm. after the trial. That report was available to everyone except for the Keith family. And when she opened it up, clearly it said that another man was paid to commit this crime. It also clearly shows that these police were actually informed. They were helping the state with information. 
and they were they were giving them daily updates of minute. what was going on. So in the other crime, it tells that they paid somebody to do Correct. it. Correct. Yes. But in this crime, they didn't, they didn't tell them that it's information. Right. Yeah. So on this one, it says he's innocent and says to who the person is. Yes. But Absolutely. on this side, that's some crazy. So, here, so here's what that means, technically, and, and this is what we all have to... That's crazy. What, where we are right now, why we're asking for a new trial. It's up to a jury who's going to decide whether or not Kevin is innocent or guilty. Mm-hmm. But in this... He deserves a fair trial because what that is called is is exculpatory evidence. Everyone knows the serial case, right? Adnan Syed out of Baltimore. Do you know this, right? Mm-hmm. Muslim boy committed, you know, convicted of murder. He's now getting a new trial. Mm-hmm. Why? Exculpatory evidence. This is what that means is the prosecution had information that could affect the jury's decision, and they never gave it to the defense. And in in the legal system. If the prosecution has information, they have to disclose it to the defense, and they never did. Why? I got, Why? I got so many questions. Well, who could get burned for it? Like, who could get burned for it? Because in one case, it's basically saying that the cops paid this individual to commit the crime. And then in another case, they're talking about the crime, but they're not saying that the cops paid the individual who would have freed your brother. You have to understand that in the, in the legal system that I've learned, once convicted I don't care if they find a smoking gun. If they don't give you a new trial, you just sit. So right now, everything's being denied. All this evidence that we found, there is no DNA in this case. There no was physical no evidence. Fitness, no physical nothing evidence. Nothing as well. And he had alibis from yes, several people. Yes. Yes. But everything Four was alibis. ignored because they knew once convicted, now you've got to go through that legal system and find your way out. And now they didn't count on me. Nobody was supposed to investigate mm-hmm. this. Had I not investigated, my brother was executed. Right. And I seen it. And what, and what they were trying to do by making sure that he got the death penalty, is that the story would go away. Yep, he's yeah. gone. So once he dies, who's going to look All into the evidence, it. once you're edu- executed, uh, all your information, documentation, every, everything they have, they destroy, they destroy it. it. The only thing that's left is your birth certificate and death certificate. Are those the, cops still working as police officers? No, they were fired. Well, I'm not going to say fired. They were mandatory, let go, given their pension. Move them out the so way. So it was a team. It was a it, it was partners, right? Who was, it was the one bad guy? Well, and and his partner, the one partner, resigned the day after Kevin was convicted and sentenced. The other one went through the pharmacy burglary uh, investigation and trial with mm-hmm. you know with the you know the state that was investigating it. Mm-hmm. That trial lasted for two days because they pulled in. They got all this information. They put these this burglary ring on trial. Lasted for two days and everyone got got took plea deals. Why? Because it leaked out that the police officer was having uh, a relationship with the confidential informant, and now he's married to her. Do you and think, she and he resigned the next day. Do you think? And we the, have all the paperwork to prove it. Do you think the jury was in on it too? Since the fact that they went for the death penalty so fast. Yes, I have found documentation, and I was telling Lori, I have the documents. I mean, everything that I've had to say, I had to have the documentation to back it up, mm-hmm. or I was just lost. Nobody was concerned about Charles's story. What do you have? So, you, as you can tell, as well as Lori is versed in this story, how often her and I have had to talk. There's no way that you can get all this stuff done in that short amount of time. And this is what I want the people to know. I wasn't an educated man. But there was something out there that I had to learn about. I wasn't an American. I didn't like America. I just lived in America. But once I saw them get my brother off death row, once I seen this lawyer work, I became American. Mm -hmm. I got a big flag in my bedroom. I get up every morning. I salute it. I kiss it. This is the first time I've seen it work. It gave me something I didn't have. You know, it actually gave me a home. And I want the people to know I used all my rights, right to free speech, right to free press. I used all my constitutional rights to fight this because I didn't have no money. I didn't even have a job. Mm -hmm. So I got played by the person who I was, a black guy in America who's nothing. So to show the people that are like me, there's hope, there's chance. And you're using the same rookie lawyer who you first went to with all the documentation? There you go, brother. Yes. Everyone, a lot of people have come up to us and said, "Why don't you just get like a big, expensive lawyer? Why don't you go after go after the big ones?" And there's big, there's big law firms now that's helping Rachel uh, Troutman, who is the the lawyer, um, who's amazing. But um, the Keith family don't. Kevin and, and Charles it's, don't want Rachel to go away. She's right. the one who no. saved his life. Yeah. It's, it's virtually impossible to beat these kind of cases with a public defender, right? 
be not, Diddy. Not so much. I, I mean, I, I gave her everything she needed. I mean, when she came on, there, as the, the system did, there was no investigation in this case. As came with the, the, the same thing with the public defender's office. She says, we don't have nothing. Oh, I had about six boxes. Mm. And they contacted me about two months later. and says, where did you get all this? I said, I investigated it. I remember when I went down to Bucyrus and I, we went to get some public records. We went inside to, to get the records and they put us inside of a cell. They closed the cell, locked us in there. I was like, oh my God, nobody even knows we're down here. Well, we just grabbed everything. They opened the door back up. We went to the desk. We paid for all the documents. And when I got home, it took me a long time to decipher that stuff. I mean, I, those are words and term, right. terms I didn't understand. Man, I had dictionaries. I'm recording myself talk. Nope, you got to change that tone. So I had to finally, I had to go in character. Mm -hmm. right. I had to stop being Charles Keith, and I had to turn into Mr. Keith. And that's somebody I'd never been. How's your brother holding up? Oh, he's doing great. He's alive. I mean, you know, you're sitting there. He told me, he says, Chuck, man, I'm sitting in here, and they're taking guys out, executing them like flies. It's unbelievable. He said the guys on death row actually helped him with his legal stuff. Wow. Because he didn't know anything either. We're and they listened to his story, and they believed him. Now, all these death row inmates are working on Kevin Keith's case. They're trying to save him, and they did. Now, some were executed, but I know that they helped Kevin Keith. We just we were just at the, at the prison seeing Kevin last week, and he tells this story. Um, he tried to describe what it was like to be on death row to me, and he said it's kind of like a dormitory, and it has 12 rooms on it. And it's kind of like the Sports Illustrated swimsuit calendar. Everyone's got a month. He goes, my month was September. Mm -hmm. So every month as the, as the calendar goes, somebody else gets executed. What made you believe? You know, because, I mean, it must be difficult for your whole family. What made you say, that's not my brother? Because I'm the oldest. I helped raise him. Kevin Keith was a 1981 football championship for Canton McKinley. Uh, he didn't want to go to college. Again, books were not heavy in the black community. Right. But he was well-liked. My brother's 6'2", 275 pounds, chiseled. I mean, no, no body fat. And I saw what they did to that big guy. And it was a message. And I received that message. So now what's the odds that I would be able to decipher this stuff and beat the state of Ohio? How did they convince the jury that your brother is guilty without presenting physical evidence? They didn't have to convince him. These were all local people. These were all people that knew the judges, the the police officer. You're talking a community where you grew up out of high school and you become into their legal system. And that judge looked like he could barely, yeah. barely live in himself. He looked like he was 900 pounds. You got people in there that are cousins, <laughs> judges, cousins, mm -hmm. lawyers, everybody. Wasn't one of the lawyers like an ex-police officer? Yeah. Awesome. Wow. So, of yeah. course, he the, had a great relationship with the Well, my department. brother's trial that attorney. That was the lawyer that was appointed to mm -hmm. them. He is yes. uh, friends with now upcoming uh, governor nominee Mike DeWine. So, you know, a lot of things just started happening. I said, wow, man, I'm actually, it just wasn't a murder case that I was fighting. I'm fighting literally the whole state of Ohio. I'm fighting. This is actually the case that President Clinton used to bring in his crime bill. Did you know that? No, really? Yes. In 94? Yes. Really? Explain. Yes. Uh, the murder happened. President Clinton falls, flies into Col uh, Columbus. He's trying to promote his crime bill. So he used this case to promote it. So when the police came down there, they were like, oh, my God. Well, we got a guy. And they didn't even do anything else. They wrapped him up, convicted him, and sent him off. The funny thing about it is once he was convicted, uh, he's convicted of murder, they allowed our family to come in and visit with him for an hour. Now, why would they show compassion at that point and no compassion anywhere else? You don't go in and visit a guy once he's convicted of murder. You don't Triple even get close homicide. to it. Yeah. But they allowed us that. Mm -hmm. Why Kevin specifically, though? He's a large, he was a large black and man. And didn't he fit the description? Name, it was a name Keith or yes. something like that? Kevin was involved in a, 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 a drug bust. It was like... Actually, it was 10 people, and it was a small thing. But now this police officer has to show that he's been doing some work. But actually, he's been over here talking to this female. He didn't know at that point that that female was the accomplice, the driver in the pharmacy ring. So when the pharmacy board comes in, he finds that out. Now, she has all this inside information on the pharmacy ring. The other informant, he only has information on this little small town drug stuff. Mm. So the pharmacy board's coming down heavy about these pharmaceutical things. These drugstores are being hit. They hit like maybe 32, 33 of them. So they were found out that it was coming into their county. They asked the police officer, you know anything about it? Oh, yeah, we know everything. Next thing you know, there's a hit. Hit goes wrong. But that other lady, she becomes the informant. 
They go to Columbus. They have the trial for the pharmacy board. Mm -hmm. He admits, or they admit the fact that they slept together, so that compromised that case. Where these guys were looking at a life sentence, they end up doing three years. You don't fear for your life? This is my brother. It's his life or my life, and I had to make decisions a long time ago. So his life, it became my life. Mm. So my name is Kevin Keith, and I fight for him as if that was me in there. My life, I'm going to die anyway at some point. I'd rather die for a cause than to die because. And if, mm. the first, one thing people will say is, well, why not take it to Barack Obama when he was in office and, and get a pardon or something like that? Was that ever possible? Tried. I tried everything. I don't have those connections. I don't know anybody. I mean, I'm from the hood. Who do I know? I mean, you got to realize in the hood, who are the most powerful people in the hood? The drug dealers. Thank you. So now you guys have this documentary, Proving Innocence. Is the docu- I saw the trailer. Is mm-hmm. the documentary completed? No, we're in production right now. Um, what's really exciting, actually, it's exciting that today's May, you know, the, the, the last weeks of May, because on May 29th, we'll get the decision from the United States Supreme Court if Kevin will get a new trial. So we're in, we're shooting this as it's happening. It's an ongoing investigation. Um, and hopefully the bulk of the storytelling of that documentary will show Charles's story and his plight to find all of this information and put this story together. And I, I just want to go back really quick to you're asking how Kevin's name was inserted. Mm-hmm. You have to keep in mind that and 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 what we had to figure out and what Charles had to figure out from police reports is that that same police officer was at the crime scene. So when the we saw a large black man description comes in, he needs to find a scapegoat. He just arrested Kevin weeks before, fit the description, inserted his name. And this is the same police officer that had that information t- two weeks before this murder happened, that it was going to go down, he knew who it. was going to do it, and how much was going to be paid. He never said a word. And, and then, then he helped with the investigation, right. still keeping that information. And he knew it all. So the other pieces of information, and, and you know, a, an eyewitness account says that the big black guy ran from that, you know, ran from the house and got into a cream colored vehicle and it was snow. It had snowed the day before. So it was super icy. It's Ohio. Right. So when he gets into the car and tries to speed away, the entire car goes into a snowbank, leaving an imprint of the front of that car in the snow and some tire tracks. OK, more evidence and goes away. That's the evidence that they have. They then, hours later, came in and had a forensic scientist come in and take castings of all of that, right? So the first thing that is the imprint in the snow, a partial license plate number was pulled from that imprint, 043. We have a police report from that night that they ran. Who has a 043 in this area in their license plate? And the alternative suspect listed in the pharmacy report is the guy who matched. Oh, my goodness. This so, is just ridiculous. So you have an idea of who the actual That's murderer is. That's why we're we here. We have facts. We have this proof. Is like you know who the actual murderer yeah. is. But see, know but see, yes. know see, it's not about him. It's about how the police set it up and allow it to happen. Mm. We're so here now because... he has this wall around him. Now, this is a black guy being right. protected by white cops. Why, though? Why did they protect the actual murderer? Because they're the ones that set the murder up. Pharmacy murder. Oh, so they cops they set the murder up. So if they caught the actual they murderer, the murderer to might have to told them. Right. Tell and say if he'd have got the right informant, if he'd have killed the right informant, the police were going to catch him on the spot. He'd have went down for the murder of the informant, and he'd have went down for the pharmacy burglaries. So that everything was okay. But when he went in and killed innocent women and children and didn't get the informant, the cops backed off. Mm. And now there's no way we can go after him now because if we go after him, everything implicates us. Mm-hmm. So they go after someone else. So when somebody said, large black man, cop took opportunity. Uh, Kevin Keith, I got a case against him. So we asked. I'm surprised they didn't kill the actual murderer, just in case. They couldn't. No more deaths. Could, nothing else could happen. Mm. Because that girl, the, the informant was actually a white girl. The cop was a white girl. The killer's black. Now the cop, the killer, and the white girl are all going together. The cop had the killer's girlfriend. Wow, this is messed why up. Weren't, why weren't any of your brother's alibis taken into account? They didn't want to hear it. Mm. Because if they take it into account, you're going to show that the judicial system there caused a the murder of a black family. How about the motive? It's either they did it or we did it. Well, how about the motive? They said that the motive, that the reason why he did that, 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 that going after whomever was in that apartment that night, they said Kevin did that because of the previous um, drug arrest that happened... 
three weeks before. Right. There were 10 people arrested that night. How come they didn't investigate the other nine? No, no this All is bla- what happened. big black men. There was not, there was 10 people that should have been busted. They, they arrested nine. They left the one loose and they let him know who the informant was. So he's got one shot. I'm getting ready to go to prison and do life. And that's what it was looking at. So he comes in and he kills the guy. Well, tried to kill the guy, couldn't find him. So he goes over and kills the women and children. This guy was high, he was zooted. I know him, I grew up with all these people. I moved out of town, you know, away, but I knew all these people personally. And that's what helped me in this case. As of, you know, as of mentioning names here, you guys wouldn't have a clue. Right. But see, I know all the players. And now I started checking each person individually. Individual, because now through working at the halfway house, I know how to research, I know how to do, write legal documents, I understand impact statements, you know, I understand all that. So how, now I got to stand for my family. How can people help? Like if people are listening right now and they, they want to help, how can they help you with this fight? You have to help educate yourself. Make noise. You got to make noise. There's no way that this man, Kevin has sit there for 24 years. Mm. I've been out here for 24 years. We both have faced the death penalty. We are both facing life without parole. Our whole family, I mean, it, it's horrible. So, and, and, and to let the people know, here I am a poor man, poorly educated and everything. But what I did and no fear in me, it got my brother off death row. And you're talking about hope and, and f- good people out there. They're out there. So my brother's last words, do you guys know what they were? Mm-mm. Help. Mm. That was his last words. And he said that because he said, because we just had this conversation with him. He said, Lori, if I, if I gave my actual last words to them, that means that I'm agreeing. I'm not giving you my last words. All I'm asking for is help. That's what he said. And it's, that's what we need to convey in the story. The documentary is one thing it's going to get made. It's not about promoting any film or anything that why we're here. We need people to listen. We need you to share the story socially, talk about it, because the only way that Kevin's going to get a new trial is if we tell the United States Supreme Court that they have no choice but to open this case. Absolutely. That's that's what we need, and that's why we're here. And we so find ba- out May 29th. Yeah. We find out May 29th. Yeah, so they make their decision on the 24th, and because it's Memorial Day weekend, they take a few days, you know, and then you they guys, come back to us on the 29th and let us know. So we'll you know, be praying all weekend. I feel honored and privileged being here because you guys are intelligent. You guys do see this. Everybody else I was talking to and telling this story were basically people from the, uh, the hood, uh, every time they see me coming, I wasn't even allowed to go to any more barbecues, outings, or nothing because here comes Charles with this story. And I told it for so many years, people got sick of hearing it. What's going to be done? So I got to go over to the white community. I got to get some help, man. They're not playing. When that date comes, they're going to execute him. And he kept writing and said, hey, Chuck, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? There's nothing I can do. Then there I found out that there was things I can do. So I'm asking help from the black community but I'm also asking for help from the American people. This is a wrong, it's an evil. They tried to use the death penalty to commit judicial murder, and that's what it is. The state of Ohio was guilty of conspiracy and corruption with the intent to do do judicial murder on Kevin Keith. If you had to to sum it up in in a minute or less, what is the truth when it comes to Kevin Keith versus the state of Ohio? Kevin Keith is an innocent man. He he, He beat the death penalty. See, God has his hands on this. Kevin Keith escaped the death penalty. He's going to get out of this, or I wouldn't be here sitting here in New York. I don't have any money to get up here. I don't know who you guys are other than, you know, the advertisements and stuff like that. I'm, I'm sitting here personally with you guys. So that shows me I've made progress. Lori Rothschild, she lives in California. I've never been to California. So it shows me my, my story found her, and it's finding everybody. And everybody that digs into it deeper, you can't go surface. When you go in deep, you're going to see the tragedy that the state of Ohio did to this young black man and our family. Well, and this keep... is happening to black men all around. Yeah, all yes. around. Right. By the way, innocent people who are in jail. We've seen people just recently getting mm-hmm. exonerated and getting out and yeah. everything, yeah. finding out that they were never guilty in the first place. Oh, yeah. But see, this one is different. This is, the, this is where a, a, a white police officer caused the murder. Mm-hmm. See, there's still a murder out there. Right. Right. And they caused it. And I understand now what aiding and abetting means. I understand what an accomplice means. I understand withholding evidence. See, I understand all these things. And these guys are guilty of totally disrespecting you know, the law. You read these stories in the news. You see them in the news. And a lot of the, the ones that rise to the top, right, are the celebrities, right? You, you hear about what's going on with Meek or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you 
everyone realizes they have a team of attorneys. They have big fat wallet. They can put people on it. This is the story for the American people who don't have that. Mm -hmm. Right. This is the reality that a lot of black families face. And everyone, I think the most relatable thing that I know about Charles is the fact that he's the older brother father figure. Mm-hmm. How many how many of my mm-hmm. friends grew up without their father and their older brother took on the role of being the dad of the house? Takes that very seriously. Yeah. Well, we Got appreciate no you. Choice. And please keep us informed of everything that's going on. Thank you. Yes. you go to, uh, what's the website? Justice? JusticeForKevinKeith.org. Mm-hmm. You can see the trailer for the documentary. Again, it's not a plug for a documentary. It's really about all of you story. listening and talking about it and be as outraged as we are right. because that's the only thing that we think is going to be able to open up that case and allow the truth to come out. Yeah. Either that or they'll keep shoving it down. If he, if they say no, we go right back into another And all these documentaries layer. have been helping. I mean, look yeah. at what, what happened with Rikers and Khalif Brown's right. story. Like, they hope. You know, this is what a lot of black people tell me. And I said, that's not true. They said, man, you know black people don't help each other. No, 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 no. Come on. I got to fight against all those things now because I need help. I don't need time for stereotypes. I don't need time to hear this. I've never been in a life and death fight. I've been in fights, but not like this. Mm -hmm. This is totally different. And I'm trying to change the mindset of our culture. And I'm also trying to reach out to the American people because now I know that we have, of, of all these things, our history, there's so many things that connect us. But that American flag, that's ours too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank we you for having Charles us. We have Charles Keith and Lori Rothschild. Thank Look you. for their uh, documentary, Proving Innocence, and it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. 